that kind of goes back to when you first came to California. Can you kind of uh, give us, you know, an outline of your when you met him, under what circumstances, how you guys became friends, and how it's kind of evolved over the years? Well, at the time I met Cameron, I was living with a girl who was a uh, PR girl in the music business, and she came home one day and she said, you've got to read the stuff this kid wrote for, for a newspaper called the San Diego Door. And I read it. Eh, you know, it's okay. She said, he's 14. Okay. 14 and a half, whatever. And um, she, he, he came up to L.A. He was living in San Diego and he came up to L.A., and we immediately hit it off because he was really, he was smart. He was funny. Um, he was also five years younger than me. All, all I know is we completely bonded. I think he was just turning 15. Um, and uh, I would pick him up. You know, we became friends and Cameron couldn't drive. He wasn't even old enough to have a learner's permit. <clears throat> so I used to pick him up at the Greyhound station in downtown L.A., um, the bus station, and I'd pick him up. I'd just gotten my driver's license. I never had one when I was growing up in New York. Um, and I'd when we'd drive to the Hyatt House, or, you know, lovingly referred to as the Riot House, or wherever it was, that, you know, he'd have an assignment. I'd do the pictures. we got, you know... Cream Magazine assignments or Changes Magazine or Crawdaddy. I can't even remember half of them. And I'd go and do the pictures and he'd do the stories. I mean, the magazines were always happy to have me go along. And, um, you know, and I they'd just pay me for what for what they, they would run. So this went on for a long time <laughs> until he became a director. <laughs> no, he finally got his... Uh, he finally got his uh, driver's license, but you know we were we were together and we've been together ever since. Um, our first Rolling Stone assignment, well, Cameron had written for Rolling Stone, but the first big his first cover assignment and my first cover assignment was to be with the Allman Brothers in '73. And there's a great story in the book <laughs> about. Just so you people know, he's behind the camera doing this. Give it up. Give it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I write the story in the book about Greg Allman and how Cameron chased after Greg to get the key interview for the piece. Now, he had done one interview. We were out on the road with the Allmans. This is the first big band that we're ever touring with. And we did this small interview, I think, in Phoenix, at a motel in Phoenix, and it, was, it wasn't the key interview, but it was the first time that he was sitting down with Greg and talking. And, you know, you can only talk to the other guys in the band so much. You know. Greg Allman's holding the keys to the the uh, interview kingdom, as it were. And we're, do, we're doing this interview. Greg's he's a little high. He's a little out there. And Greg had these little vials that were on the end table next to the bed where he's sitting and he's got an acoustic guitar and he's playing a little and he's the vials and he keeps trying to pass the vials around and Cameron the writer politely would decline every time a vial would pass by the photographer would politely accept you know boom 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 cut to X amount of days later and uh, we're sharing a room because Rolling Stone wasn't going to pay for two rooms the phone rings one one early evening, and I pick up the phone, and it's for Cameron, and and he slams down the phone. And he says, "Greg's going to do the interview, you know, finally." Now he'd been chasing Greg for, for around a week at this point. It was getting iffy if it was going to happen, just like in Almost Famous when the kids chasing Billy Crudup around for the key interview. It, this all comes from the Allman Brothers. Um, so Cameron goes up, does the interview. I go up with him. I take some quick photos of Greg, one of which 40 years later became the cover of his autobiography. You know, it's weird how life points you in that direction. Um, and uh, 
Then I leave, and Cameron's up there alone, does the interview, comes back down a couple hours later, says, oh, man, what an interview. And he's holding this brown paper bag with all the tapes, you know, the little record, the cassette tapes in the bag. He says, Greg was really out there, but he was talking about Dwayne, and he was, you know, the real shit. He's in the middle of telling me the story. Phone rings again. I pick it up. Hello? And it's Red Dog, one of the Almonds roadies. And he says, hey, it's Red Dog. I say, hey, Red Dog, it's Dion. What's up? He says, is your little buddy there? Sure. I hand Cameron the phone. He starts talking. The, the color kind of drains out of his face. And puts down the phone. He says, uh, Greg wants me to come back upstairs, bring all the tapes. You know, I don't know what to do. You know, something's up, blah, blah, blah. You know, do what you... I didn't have any words of wisdom, although, I mean, it's in retrospect, don't go up there, but, you know, he did what he did, and he came back down a little while later, no tapes. And he said, Greg thinks I'm a cop. You know, why do you think you're a cop? Because you wouldn't get high with him like I did. He didn't think the photographer was a cop. Um, you know, he thinks his dead brother Dwayne's in the room telling him I'm a cop. They can't trust me. You know, and this is a disaster. This is first cover story. You've now given Greg Allman the tapes back. And you've got killer shit on the tapes, but you'll never be able to use it. So... And, and he's distraught. Cameron's distraught. I mean, we're both distraught, you know. When he was up there bringing the tapes back, I had taken my film and put some of my film under the mattress, you know, figuring if they if they tried to get some of the film back for me, I'd just say, oh, the film went to the lab. Not that I knew the names of any labs it's in um, San Francisco. Uh, this was at the Miyako Hotel. Uh, at any rate, the next day, Many phone calls ensued between Cameron and his editor, Ben, ben Functories, and uh, Jan Winter, and Mike Hyland, who was the Almonds PR guy. Phil Walden got into the act, too, who was their manager and owned their, their record label. Uh, and, a, and Cameron called me and said, I just got a call from Phil Walden. And Phil says, hey, Cameron, how you doing? It's Phil Walden. Hey, you know what, buddy? You know, Greg, Greg found these tapes, this bag of tapes. He doesn't know how he got them, man, but they're yours, you know. We're going to get them back to you, you know. However, that was the, the good news. The bad news is the Almonds had already checked out of the hotel and were on their way to Hawaii where they had a gig. And Cameron, could, his mom would not let him stay on the road one day longer, just like Fran McDormand in the movie. It's like, you've got tests, you got it. And he had to go back to San Diego. So it was decided that someone needed to be drafted to go to Honolulu to get the tapes. And uh, I got on a plane that I, either that day or the, I don't remember, but as soon as possible, and got to Honolulu and happy to say that I saw the greatest show of the entire tour, at least when we were out. Oh, man, they were smoking hot. And, uh, and I got the tapes back. I don't remember who actually handed me the tapes, but they were in the same brown paper bag that Cameron brought them up to Greg's room in. And uh, obviously hadn't even been opened, much less the tapes been listened to. And that's the story of how we saved the Rolling Stone uh, story. And it's funny because we were talking about that recently. And... Cameron's had a, a, a wonderful career as a writer and, and a screenwriter and a director and an author. And, and it, things could have turned out differently if he would have lost his job at Rolling Stone over that. So I like to think that was my little uh, contribution to keeping the status quo. And it's funny, I haven't really talked about that story in such detail as in a while. <laughs> That that's 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 just one of a trillion stories. But you know that kind of cemented our um, our friendship. And and Cameron wrote a remarkable, and I do mean remarkable, two page um, intro uh, forward, if, if you will, in my book, uh, 
that makes me cry every time I read it. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's very uh, gut-wrenching, not gut-wrenching, but it really pulls up my heartstrings and um, captures our friendship and how he looked up at me when we were growing up. Oh, man. Uh, go figure. Go figure. And, uh, you know, to Alice, Cameron's mom, I say, I love you very much. You are my my surrogate mom, because my mom's not around anymore, and, and I will always have your son's back. <laughs> Sweet. Now, how did that? Uh, how did that develop? At at what point did that develop into uh, a, a story idea and a, uh, an idea for a script and a film? Well, it, I can't really say, but I I know that the early incarnations of Almost Famous had a different title, and it was a, a, a pretty much a different story, and um, I. However, you writers. <laughs> you know, figure out what you want to write about is beyond me. But um, at some at some point it morphed from the the early script that I had read, which had a different title and was a, pretty much a different story, into this true story, which was autobiographical, um, uh, about a kid who's a 15-year-old rock writer on the road with a, with a rock band for Rolling Stone. I mean, I like to think that whether you, whether you like Almost Famous or don't, it is probably one of the most original movies ever made. No one else could have written that because no one else had that experience. And it's, and it's nailed. I mean, aside from a few little things here and there, I mean, you know, as I like to say, the, the real groupies back then were not quite as sweet and sugary they were bitchier and nastier and higher and and more competitive and you know that kind of thing but but it really nails the feeling of how it felt being out with these guys and being part of the circus that moves around and you know as the kid found out in the movie it's not all glamorous well, now you worked on uh, as a uh, unit guy on that mm -hmm. on the on the shoot, right? Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, it was it was wild working on that movie. Um, at the time, when Cameron first called me and said, "You should, you know, if you're into it, you should do the stills on Almost Famous." Um, he had finished Jerry Maguire, um, and I guess he. <laughs> We'll just say he felt that I was a better match for Almost Famous than the guy who had shot stills on Jerry Maguire. Um, so I had to make the decision. He wasn't, he wasn't sure. He'd never seen me on, on a job for more than a day here or a day there. So he wasn't sure how I'd fit in with the whole crew mentality. And, you know, because there's a structure to it. And... Um, what he didn't realize is that's, that was right up my alley because I, I was starting to get really tired of all the travel. And, you know, this is in 1999, right? So, God, 19 years ago. Um, so it, the time was just was right. And, and I, had, I had to join the union, and I had the requisite amount of days uh, that I'd spent on film shoots or video shoots or, you know, you had to prove you had 100 days and I had way more than that. But he, he still had to write a fairly passionate uh, letter to the union to get to get them to let me in because I couldn't have worked on the movie without being a member of the union, Local 600, Cinematographer's Guild. Um, turns out the letter he wrote landed square on uh, a, a, a lady's desk who was someone that we knew who had been a, a photographer in the music business uh, earlier on and was was now um, uh, the number two person at the union. And she rubber stamped the letter too sweet. And all of a sudden I was the unit guy on Almost Famous. Um, I remember the night before we started shooting. It was either the Friday night before Monday 
or Saturday night before Monday, I went up to the director of photography, John Toll, who had won two Oscars at that point, and I introduced myself to him, and I said, I just thought I'd say hi, and I'm going to be around, which is something I'd normally do on a, on a tour, you know. And I said, uh, anything I need to know or you want to point out to me? And John Toll looked at me and said, you'll figure it out. That's all he said to me. <laughs> Which I now take as a, as a supreme vote of confidence. I didn't know what to think of it at the time. Um, but it, to this day, when I, when I, if I were to run into any of the members of Stillwater, you know, in real life, Billy Crudup or Jason Lee or Mark or, um, or John, I would, to me, they're still members of Stillwater. They're not the actors that they are, that they, or that they were playing them. It's very bizarre. It was like a tour in, a, in and of itself. Tour within a tour. Yeah. And um, keep in mind that the actual girl that, that got traded for the case of beer was a groupie I used to fraternize with in San Diego. And, you know, I was around for all, pretty much all the real stuff that happened but my, um, my, I wasn't written in as a character, nor did I care if I was or not. I mean, I'm not part of the story. Um, and it was, but it was, it was like a tour within a tour. It really, really was. Um, and strangely enough, after we wrapped, I believe... I remember going to dinner with Kate one night, very innocently, and um, she told me she had just met this guy.